Okay, let's get right into it. My name is Pierce Delahunt. I'm a leftist educator. We're going to be going over U.S. government and politics 101, but not your underfunded public school version or your elitist private school capitalist propaganda version either. The leftist version. We'll talk about what that means. Before we go into that specific content, I want to acknowledge that I am in the United States of America, the entirety of which is on stolen land, and that I am in Berkeley, California, which is Ohlone territory. So I want to acknowledge that there is a tremendous land theft that has occurred. And one of the best ways that we can repair for that theft is through what is called a land tax. Here in Berkeley, California, we can give to the Segurate Land Trust. That land tax then is called a Shumi in that corresponding language. But wherever you are in the United States or in other relevant countries, you will be able to find a place that you can give some kind of land tax to. A good resource is native-land.ca is just one. This is a map to give you an idea of the land theft over time that has happened and is still in fact happening, which is extremely relevant for U.S. government and politics 101. The resources for some of this stuff is in the slides that you can click on in the description below. And with that, we will move forward into the specific workshop. Here we go. So teaching U.S. government and politics 101, I would bring this voter simulation into a classroom. So I'm going to walk y'all through it as we go. It is going to continue through the presentation. I have done this voter simulation before, and it's a really fun way to engage the students or campers in a living, breathing politic rather than just reading it stale off the page. So with that, we have to decide on something to vote on. And in the classroom, what we've done before is we tell the students and campers that we get to vote on what we're having for lunch the next day. So we tell them we've arranged with the lunch staff that it will either be a Latin theme, maybe tacos, or an Asian theme, maybe ramen. We leave it a little vague to give the lunch staff some flexibility in what that will look like. But that way, the campers or students can still engage in a voter democracy simulation. Depending on your setting, you can also rework what your students or campers are voting on. For instance, maybe they're voting on the activity that they want to do for recess tomorrow if you still have recess at your school, but you can use your imagination. That's the setup. And so when we do that, we tell them now that you are eligible voters, we're giving you your voter ID cards and we'll give out some green, some yellow and some red, and there will be different information on each. And I think you might be able to see where this is leading. We tell them not to look at their ID uh, until they get up to vote. But if they look at it, it also doesn't ruin it either. It'll be fine. So. We give out the voter IDs and then we explain the bare basics of U.S. government and politics and the structure of how the things work. I'm sure many of you have seen this kind of thing before. There are three branches in the U.S. government. There's the executive, the legislative and the judicial. And most people in the United States have federal representatives who are the president and senators and House representatives. And what's really important about the senators and the House reps is that they are on committees. And the committees are important because a bill gets introduced through a committee. It's not just an individual who introduces a bill, but through the relevant committee that introduces a bill to then maybe become law. And I like to emphasize that because I think that the committees don't get a lot of attention in this conversation. But then you also have your local reps, your governor, your mayor, your city council, and they also don't get a lot of attention, even though the city council are the people that you are most likely to be able to affect or make an impression on, or actually talk to even. And then it's also worth noting that not everyone in the United States has these representatives, depending on if you live in, say, Puerto Rico. But we're going to get to that a little later in the presentation. Ways to engage with your representatives, your representative outreach. This also gets maybe a sentence in a presentation like this usually. But the really important thing to understand is that the outreach is effective in proportion to how much it bothers your representatives, which is to say that, for instance, an online petition is very ineffective because it is entirely too easy for the representative staff to just delete them and never pay any mind to them. Whereas a phone call is a little more bothersome because now the staff have to deal with tied up phone lines and then they're complaining to the representative and then the representative has to hear about it. So the outreach that you do is effective in proportion to the degree of pressure that that outreach is applying. 
if you protest outside of your representative's house. That's a very effective form of engaging in democracy, one that is so effective that people actually take measures to stop from happening. But that's a good sign that it is doing something. I do believe strongly that some representatives should never be able to eat dinner in public in peace so long as they are still in power. And then one final piece on the basics here is that you have a law or bill which is introduced via committee, as we mentioned. Then you also have a ballot initiative, which is a way to circumvent your representatives to actually make a law based on a voter referendum. So that is an option. And in fact, a lot of meaningful reforms have happened that way. And it takes a lot of work, which involves getting people to sign a petition to put it on the ballot. And then you have to do a campaign to convince voters to vote for your ballot initiative while also navigating the propaganda that's coming from the interested relevant parties, likely corporate powers in order to squash your ballot initiative. So it does take a lot of work, but it is a way that meaningful reform can happen that goes around your representatives rather than needing to rely on your ability to engage with them. Moving just a little bit into the weeds from the basics, we have different models of how a winner of a vote is decided. The dominant model that United States elections use from president to local elections is called plurality, or more specifically, winner take all, or sometimes called first past the post. But there are a lot of different ways that voting for candidates can look. A really popular alternative right now is called ranked choice voting. And it's a really great model in a lot of ways that some of the resources that I link to will speak to. But it's a little more detailed than we're going to get into right now. And now that we know how voting works in this country, we're going to allow the people with green voter IDs to come on up and vote. So then they form a line and they can just tell you and you can keep a tally or you can have a secret voting box, however you want to do it. So as they come up, they're going to read what it says on their voter IDs. And in this simulation, the people with green voter IDs will have something like they work a salary job that is not dependent on their hours. So they could take the time away from work to get to the voting booth. Or they speak English and their voting booth is in English. Or they live within walking distance of a voter booth. A variety of things like that. And the reasons for this, again, are in the slides. Moving into something that is almost never brought up in any U.S. government and politics 101 class is what we call political economy. Now, I know that some of y'all have seen this from my other videos, so I'm going to give it a real quick run through here. But political economy is just the combination of politics and economics. There are two primary forms of political economy. You have socialism on the left and you have capitalism on the right. And it's not about government versus business. That's a different tension altogether. The tension between socialism and capitalism is just who is in control. And you have workers in control under socialism and you have owners in control under capitalism. And they are in that tug of war over control of the means of production. Examples of means of production include land, education, raw materials, factories, bodies, intellectual property. But the main one that we're going to emphasize is labor because under capitalism, workers sell their ability to perform labor to owners and owners rent out the other means of production to the workers so that they can perform labor on those means of production and create profit for the owners. To give a more concrete example about it, the house that you live in and personally use is your personal property, which is not a means of production. While on the other hand, the house that you rent out and profit from but don't live in, that is a means of production and is your private property. And you can see here that the house that you rent out is your private property and is also the personal property of the people who live in it. So one piece of property can be both one person's private property and another person's personal property. And the really important thing that I want everyone to take away from this is that there is no transcending the tension between socialism and capitalism because there's going to be means of production. Things are going to be produced. Services are going to be rendered. And someone is going to be in control of those means of production. And either they're going to be workers or they're going to be owners. There's no way around that. There's no transcending this tension. This tension exists and we can choose to engage in it in an intentional way. Or we can tell ourselves that we're not engaging it, in which case we're just letting the status quo exist. And currently the status quo is one of capitalism. To draw out a little more of the political landscape, I really like the tool, the political compass. I know there are critiques of it. I can critique it as well. 
but I'm going to offer it here because it's a really great 101 resource to draw from. It has a lot of interesting material as well as questions to engage you in these kinds of thoughts. And wherever you show up, I answered the questions to intentionally get a perfect centrist here. But wherever you show up, you can take a look at the people in your quadrant and you can read their work or watch speeches from them to get an idea of maybe these are people who resonate with you. And I just want to address that the political figures represented here are only put into the relevant quadrant. They're not put in spaces that are actually meaningful compared to the other people in their quadrant. It's just that they're in the quadrant and that's all that is. So again, we can get more nuanced with the compass, but that's more than I want to do with this presentation right now. And so now that we have a little more context, the people with the yellow voter IDs can come on up and vote. And we're again going to ask them to read their voter ID aloud for everyone. And now the people with the yellow voter IDs, theirs will say something like they live far away from a voter booth, but they have a car or they would usually work that day, but they found someone to cover their shift or they don't speak English, but the voter booth had translation services or they have a disability, but that voter booth had accommodations, that kind of thing. And again, resources in the slides. This prompts the discussion about voter suppression. Now, you may have heard of voter fraud before. But voter fraud is actually a rhetorical sleight of hand to get people to be blaming the victims who are the voters, or rather the people who are trying to be voters but can't vote. And in talking about the different forms that voter suppression take, one of the really important examples in this country is that in 2015, the Supreme Court voted to overturn the Voting Rights Act. So you'll see here that 2016 was the first presidential election in 50 years without the Voting Rights Act. And there are a number of strategies that states employ to oppress voters. I also like to introduce here this quotation that is commonly attributed to Mark Twain, but the source is actually a little murky. The quotation here is, if voting changed anything, they would make it illegal. And it is often said in a fun, quippy way. And it is also true that voter suppression is exactly that example of people trying to make voting illegal. Voter IDs are just one way to make it harder for people to vote legally. But I'm going to touch on a few of the grander ways that the United States suppresses votes. One that I'm sure many of y'all have already heard of is gerrymandering. So here's an infographic that explains the concept that through the two different techniques of packing and cracking, you can actually give a minority of voters a landslide victory. Again, here is more details that I want to get into in this presentation. But one of the main points that I want to make with this right now is that if you look at these strategies of packing and cracking, and you look at what the Electoral College does to states, you can see that the states that are represented in this illustration as being physically smaller, like California and New York, are examples of packing those populations, while the people in the states that this illustration represents as physically larger, like Wyoming and North Dakota, are cracked for their votes to have more weight than the people in those smaller states. This is to say that the Electoral College itself is a gerrymander, and was designed that way to benefit people who believed in buying and selling other people. That was the explicit purpose of the Electoral College, and the Electoral College has always been and remains a tool of the right. Again, this is just one form of voter suppression, and there are more resources on this in the slides. But moving to the next form of voter suppression, I want to talk about felon disenfranchisement. Here we have a color-coded map of the states based on their relationship to whether convicted felons can vote. Nine states will remove votes from convicted felons permanently, and three states will allow convicted felons to vote even from prison. In the United States, over 6 million people cannot vote because of felon disenfranchisement laws, which is 1.7% of the U.S. population. Now, that may sound like a small percentage, but firstly, it matters, period. Secondly, it matters that it's happening to 6 million people. And thirdly, it also matters that the injustice is happening in unjust ways. For instance, 1 in 13 Black Americans are unable to vote because of these same felon disenfranchisement laws, which is 7.7% of the Black American population. It is also worth noting that the disenfranchisement is happening unevenly across the states. So you can see here that there are two states where the disenfranchisement has actually affected more than 10% of the population of those states. So 10% of their population just unable to participate in electoral politics. One single sentence summary for why this is such a big deal comes from the Twitter account of Anthony Oliveira, who says that a government that denies its prisoners the right to vote is a government that now has an extremely vested interest in jailing its political opposition. If you don't already know, this is the very reason for the rise of mass incarceration since Nixon, who jailed the political opposition among his voter base under the guise of being tough on drugs. And if you want to learn more about that, the link to the video I already did on that subject in the slides. 
but we cannot talk about ways that the United States is practicing voter suppression without talking about imperialism and colonialism. This is by far the most impactful strategy that the United States employs to impose its own will on a public. The little bit I'm going to say about it right now before we return to it more in depth later in this presentation is that almost every single map you've ever seen of the United States is incomplete because those maps rarely ever show Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, and all of the other islands that the United States has colonized in its history to today. Where those islands are inhabited, they are unable to vote in the electoral process. And where those islands are uninhabited, the United States has colonized them for other strategic purposes, often for resources that more rightfully belong to other nations or for strategic locations for military bases. But that's just regarding land that quote unquote belongs to the United States of America. This map overlaid across that one is an incomplete map of countries whose electoral processes the U.S. has somehow disrupted. And yes, this map is extremely incomplete. I just use it because it overlaps nicely onto the other one. We're going to get more into that later. For now, we invite all the students with the red voter IDs to line up for their vote. And honestly, this is one of my favorite parts of the simulation. It's when the students read their red voter IDs, which will say things like they were unable to get off work or didn't have a car to get to their voter booth, or their voter booth didn't have translation or disability accommodations, or they couldn't get a voter ID because their only address is a P.O. box. And we actually do tell them that they cannot vote on what is for lunch tomorrow. And yes, they do get extremely upset, at which point we can invite them to imagine on how upsetting it might be for people who cannot vote in their government's electoral process. But honestly, sometimes that just makes it worse. So now we talk about how the system actually works, which is to say who are U.S. government representatives representing. This graph here has as the x-axis the percentage of support any given idea or bill or law has, and as the y-axis the likelihood that that idea or bill or law will pass. And that purple line there represents that there is a 30% likelihood that any given idea, bill, or law will pass no matter what percentage of support it has among the poorest 90% of the population. The yellow line, on the other hand, represents the likelihood that any given bill, law, or idea will pass based among the support it has among the wealthiest 10% of the population. And you can see here that the wealthiest 10% of the population enjoy an almost ideal representation in government, while the poorest 90% basically have no representation in government at all. Resources in the slides, yes, it actually is that bad. This is my other favorite part of the simulation where I get to hold up the tally and I say tomorrow's lunch will be and then I tear it up as I say decided by our big donors. Now when I'm working at a nonprofit camp I explain that our ability to eat literally does come from the people who donate food and money to that nonprofit camp. And if at a public school I explain that their ability to eat comes from taxes and public funds. And if at a private school I explain that their ability to eat comes from the tuition paid for by their parents and guardians. This may sound like a cruel joke but it leads us into a discussion on campaign finance. So this is a graph from 2000 to 2016 on the percentage of races won by the top spending candidate in both the House and Senate. And you can see that that percentage has never been below 70%. This here is a graph from 1960 to 2012 on presidential campaign spending. Almost all of those elections were won by the bigger spender. This graph here is one that includes 2016. And you'll notice here that Clinton spent way more money on her campaign than Trump did. But the 2016 election has a big asterisk on it. That asterisk being that in the 2016 campaign, media sources gave a ton of free press to the Trump campaign. If you factor in the value of that free press, that amounts to way more than what Clinton spent. With the 2020 election, again, not only did Biden spend a lot more than Trump, but at this point, the media gave much less free coverage to the Trump campaign. That is among other issues that were at play, but it does matter. All this is to say that the answer to the question who wins is that spenders win. Spenders win elections. But this raises the question who funds these campaigns? Now, if you think it is unions, we're going to disprove that notion right now. This is a graph of corporate PAC spending compared to labor PAC spending in congressional elections, and corporate spending has always been higher. Looking at just the 2012 election, the Koch brothers, who are two people, spent well over twice what all unions spent on their political funding combined. Do you remember that political compass? The people in the very upper right corner, they're the ones with the money, they're the ones with the influence. But this raises the question, what is all that campaign money being spent on? And the answer to that is the media. You got to get in front of people to convince them to vote. 
joke for you. Little known PR history, the field of public relations used to be called propaganda. Changing the term from propaganda to public relations was itself a PR move. Now, this is one of my favorite examples of the power of public relations or propaganda. So you can see here the overwhelming scientific consensus on climate crisis. And you can see here the media overrepresentation of a skeptical or denialist viewpoint. And you can see here the public perception of the issue. Now, this information is a little dated at this point, but the takeaway of how powerful the media is absolutely still stands. Talking about the structure of the media industry itself, I refer to the famous quotation from Marshall McLuhan, the media is the message. And when we have a media industry in which 90% of everything that U.S. Americans consume is now owned not by six, but five companies, which is just five CEOs with a board of executives of maybe 10 people each, the overwhelming majority of whom are able-bodied cishet white men, and every single one of whom is a wealthy capitalist. Yes, that absolutely determines the message you will receive. At this point, I would show a funny video to help this information go down smoother. So I present to you Honest Gil. Hi, I'm Gil Fulbright. And the people who bankroll my political career tell me I'm running for president. So here I am. Real hardworking Americans are important to me is a tagline I will be using throughout this entire campaign. Listening to my constituents, legislating, these are things I don't do. What I do is spend about 70% of my time raising funds for re-election. Ideas, policies, morals. These are things I don't need. What I need is $2 billion. These are the things that are important to me. And these are the fine people that finance my campaign. Now, in order to do these things, I have to stay in office. And to stay in office, I have to keep these guys happy. Now, if any of these things make these guys unhappy, well, my hands are tied. I have a five-step plan for making America better. Appeal to special interest billionaires and lobbyists behind closed doors. Raise $2 billion. Promise you earnestly that it'll be different this time. Get elected. Break all my promises to you and work tirelessly for the big donors who bought my presidency. Here's the part where I gloss over important issues. Issues like education and making it uh, good. The economy and improving it by repeating the word jobs and blah, 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 something to get votes from women and minorities. This campaign, it's not about me. It's about crafting a version of me that'll appeal to you. I may not be qualified to be president, but a dramatic camera angle can make me look like a president. A president with the conviction to nod, the courage to point, and the experience to cram buzzwords into everything I jobs. Every four years, Americans are faced with a critical choice. Clinton or Bush or someone else. Well, I'm Gil Fulbright, and with a big enough donor, I can be that someone else. So come November, the choice is clear. Do you want another spineless mouthpiece for special interest in lobbyists or a spineless mouthpiece for special interest in lobbying? I'm honest Gil Fulbright, and I approve of whatever my marketing team has put into this message. Oh, the Chesapeake Bay, huh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be a that'd be a great landfill. Why, oh, you're still here? You must want a political favor. Well, no can do without a donation. Click here to chip in. Go ahead, pause the video and do it. What's that? Radioactive? So? So a funny video that does illustrate the really important need for campaign finance reform. So let's take a moment to talk about government spending. Now, this is often framed as the question of where did our tax dollars go? But it's really important to note that federal spending is actually not funded by tax dollars. In the United States, federal government, when they want money, they spend it into existence. So the question of where did your federal tax dollars go? The answer to that is when you write a check and your bank account goes down by however much, there is no corresponding bank account anywhere in the world that goes up by that amount. It is figuratively incinerated. And when people used to pay their taxes in person, which apparently you can still do in some places, that literal money was literally incinerated. For more info on this, check out Modern Monetary Theory, links in the slides. All that said, this is still a helpful infographic in terms of the percentages of government spending, so we're going to look at it. 
and you can see that most federal spending goes to Medicare, Social Security, and the military. And most graphics like these divide the military spending from the veterans benefit spending, which I do understand, but the veterans benefit spending is absolutely also military spending. And it is also true that some of the spending on things like education, food and agriculture, international affairs and science, and energy and the environment are also really military spending in secret. Examples include school spending on the Junior Razzi program, on the capitalist imperialist propaganda that they teach in schools, and also how some U.S. food aid is a modern-day version of smallpox blankets, in which that food aid is sent seemingly as a gift, but is actually intended to disrupt the food sovereignty of the nation that the United States is sending it to, rendering those countries dependent on the food imported from the United States, making them more susceptible to being pressured into U.S. interests. Some more graphics on those same things. We see here that total federal spending of 2021 was seven trillion dollars. Again, mostly Social Security, Medicare, and the military. One really important thing to note here is that a big chunk of the spending on Social Security and Medicare goes to the inflated bureaucracy of having a means-tested system. If we just had universal Medicare and universal Social Security, way more of that money would go to direct aid, which would help way more people and also vastly reduce costs. There's also a difference between mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Mandatory spending is federal spending that is required by law, which is basically just Social Security and Medicare. But discretionary spending is spending that gets discussed every year when they set the budget for that year. Now, Social Security and Medicare, people fought for and died for and took massive, unprecedented movements and crises to make happen and cannot be changed without a change to law. So discretionary spending is actually a better reflection of the values of the government. And you can see that when given the power to decide, the government spends a huge amount on the military. 2021 numbers were $752 billion or 47% of discretionary spending. Other sources will have slightly different numbers, which we're going to look at right now. If we compare military budgets across the globe, we see that the United States here spends over $800 billion, which is almost half of the total global military spending of $2.1 trillion. The only country that comes anywhere near what the U.S. is spending is China, which is still well less than half what the U.S. is spending. Every single other country on the planet spends closer to Costa Rica zero dollars than to the United States 800 billion. And this is one thing that both Democrats and Republicans can agree on. They love military spending. This raises the really obvious question, what does U.S. military spending buy? This infographic is just one look at that. It has two parts that we're going to zoom in on the top half here. And we see that the U.S. has 750 foreign military bases in 80 countries around the world. That's actually over 95% of all foreign military bases on the planet. You can see that those red dots are spread all over, except for Russia and China. And there's a reason that the media is villainizing those countries in particular. Also worth noting the military base in Cuba, Guantanamo Bay, where the United States famously tortures people in Cuba, a country that was only recently freed from a U.S.-backed dictatorship in 1959. The United States also has about 173,000 troops deployed in 159 countries. You can see the majority of those are in Europe, Australia, Japan, and South Korea. Really important question here is how do you think the U.S. government would feel if Russia, China, Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, or any other country had military bases or troops stationed just outside of U.S. borders, or in some cases even in U.S. borders? Mm -hmm. And on the bottom half of that original infographic, we can get a better look at the countries that the United States is most occupying based on both the number of military bases and the number of troops. The top three being the same, Japan, Germany, and South Korea. And just because I know some of y'all are thinking it, yes, the infographic was made by Al Jazeera, but the sources for the information is actually the other line there, one of which is the United States government itself. Now, does that make it more or less trustworthy? That's up to you. This brings me to that more complete map I was talking about. This is a map of countries where the United States government has admitted to launching military interventions, not just electoral interference more broadly, but specifically military interventions, and just the countries where the U.S. government has admitted it. The original source of this is, again, the U.S. government itself, and you can see that this is actually most countries on Earth. And when you consider the hundreds of tribal nations that the United States has continued to overthrow, it's even worse than this image. Now, I want to take a moment to say something really important here. But setting up the context of the point is a little nerdy. So the context is dialectical materialism. And dialectical materialism is a fancy phrase, but it just refers to this idea that yes, social relations and property relations influence each other, 
and property relations is generally more dominant in that influence. So you can look at the diagram here and you can see that who owns the means of production in a given factory, say, is going to influence the culture within that factory. The property relations of a workplace are the context for whatever culture thrives there. And that can be a healthy or unhealthy culture that does the thriving. So that's the nerdy context. But my primary takeaway point that I want to emphasize is this. Given the global context of US imperialism, which employs a staggering amount of military violence, state violence, electoral violence, and pervasive media disinformation and propaganda, we are not going to meaningfully address capitalism, racism, sexism, and any other system of oppression without also addressing that global context. The dominant global context of US imperialism is what allows toxic cultures of class, racism, and sexism to thrive. This, of course, raises the question, what do we do? And the always available three-part answer to that question is agitate, educate, organize. Starting with educate, we can always, always, always learn more ourselves, and we can do that in conversation with others where they are learning too. Pro tip for learning about something new, see how that issue intersects with an issue you're already familiar with. Have these conversations with others. That can be a book club. That can be a study group where you read an article and talk about it once a week or watch a YouTube video or listen to a podcast. So much good agitation and organizing has come out of exactly those kinds of study groups. And please, please, please offer the majority of your generous listening to those who are left of you and the majority of your agitation and pushback to those who are right of you. Really valuable fundamental principle. And if you do go into organizing, this is the primary infographic that I want to emphasize for you. We can delve way more into this, but the key takeaways here are sabotage opponents, win over neutrals, and increase camaraderie among comrades. That's organizing in a nutshell. But again, more resources on this in the slides. I want to leave y'all with some reflection questions. I have here the tree of contemplative practices. Maybe you do your best contemplation in stillness, maybe in movement, maybe in creative expression but I offer you these prompts to contribute to your contemplation. Number one is how might I support the government that I want and what is the government that I want? Really great question. And number two is how do threats to representation in general threaten my own representation? I offer this prompt in part to ask you to lean into solidarity. Eugene Debs said, while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. And as we have already discussed, yes, imprisonment is a political representation issue. And then finally, the quotation from radical educator John Dewey, we don't just learn from experiences, we learn from reflecting on the experience. And again, I ask you to do that reflecting in conversation with others. And to close it all off, I offer you these resources, which I'll walk you through. Lower left over here is all the fundamentals that I always offer. And the right half of this slide is all that dedicated to voting and representation. That first article there is from myself, and it's the ways that the United States suppresses votes. Goes into a lot more depth than what we've already covered here. And then the right half of this slide is all about the bipartisan war machine, emphasizing in particular military violence and also media propaganda. So that's United States Government and Politics 101. Thank you so much for offering your attention. And this one in particular means a lot to me, so I do ask that you share and do all the YouTube things. Thank you, comrades.